Welcome back to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, he is Steve, and who knew Groundhog Day could be so much fun? Episode 242 today, September 23rd, 2021. We're going to be catching up with each other as we have not done so in a while before we go into our topic of the day, which is the Death Loop Impressions, which you can fast forward if you... Look at the timestamps located in the detailed section (laughs) below. Steve, I know that there has been a number of things that you have been, uh, shall we say, dying to tell me about. Looking forward to telling me about. Well, just one in particular. I can tell you about the buzz. I mean, there's been stuff that we've been watching, eh? but it's just like repeat stuff of like stuff we've already watched. Mm. One thing, though, that we haven't seen, that we saw recently, mm. this is Piper. 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 The short story by Pixar came out in 2016 with Finding Dory. Mm -hmm. I saw Finding Dory, but the thing is, since I rented it on Netflix, the disc they give you doesn't have the short film on it. Ah, yes. And I remember (laughs) thinking at the time, like, WTF over. Like, (laughs) Pixar, like, are you not doing it anymore? What's going on? Because we look forward to them. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, maybe they're not doing it. Maybe Finding Dory was not like a big movie, so they, they left it off. And I remember the, the disc saying, like, oh, for all the features, you know, buy the movie. I'm like, that's I didn't want to buy the movie. That's why I rented it from you. Uh-huh. So anyway, we're looking through Disney+. Plus and you're watching a couple things, like What If, for example, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> and uh, What If is very good, by the way. We watched a couple of them episodes there, right? Get good. We'll talk about that. It's great. Anyhow. (laughs) Yeah. So she was kind of fiddling on her phone a little bit. Fiddling on her phone. Who who are we talking about here, Steve? My domestic partner. (laughs) My (laughs) live-in chef of sorts. I understand. (laughs) And accountant. (laughs) I know whom you speak of now. So anyway... Uh, I noticed I'm like, I'm, I'm going through the, the, the little short stories. I'm scrolling through it and I'm like, okay, yeah, I've seen that one, seen that one, seen that one. And I came across Piper. Hmm. Now it's six minutes long Mm -hmm. and it's probably the best six minutes of film you'll watch all week, Russ. I don't know if I've seen Piper. You haven't seen it, Russ. How do you know? Because I, you would have told me about it. When did it come out? What year? 2016. 2016. Well, okay, so give me a brief description of what Piper is. So and I will Piper tell you. is a little sandpiper, a little bird that kind of, the only little birds that run along this, this seashore and they kind of pick at little creatures that are buried in the sand to eat, you oh, know? I've seen it. You I've have seen it. not. I have indeed. I have seen it. You, you didn't even tell me about it. To be fair, though, I didn't see it in 2016. Whatever. Okay. I, I did. So, but I did see it like two years ago because my daughter was watching. Uh, I, th- you know what? Oh, uh, what? She was going through. They they have like this um, playlist of all the different Pixar shorts. Uh huh. So that's how I saw it. It was like she was going through, and uh, yeah, that one is very precious. Continues, Steve. So the. Oh, like the sand and the water is... Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's done so well. I'm like, how is this going to be a short? I mean, it looks so real. Like, you know, you, they're usually like cartoon characters sort of thing that they they, they show. I'm like, they, they, the, the birds look real and the sand and the water, everything looks real. And so there's no verbiage. There's nothing spoken. There's no language, right? Just two birds. Yeah. And like one, one of them is a baby, right? One's the baby. Yeah. One's the mom. Mm-hmm. And so the mom leaves the nest, goes to the water and the baby's like, okay, yeah, go get me food. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so the mom's like, no, nope, no, nope, come on. You got to find out, you know, find, fend for yourself. Sure. Find out how to do this. And so, um, anyway, the, the, you know, the bird kind of gets his courage together and, yeah. and starts making its way down the seashore and the waves look, you know, ginormous, you know, that, that it's, that's thinking they actually are when they're not, um, kind of befriends a crab in a way like the crab who's smaller than it is, is walking along 
uh-huh. you know, and, and it is able to submerge itself, hold its breath or whatever, however they breathe. I don't know. Right. Whatever they do. Um, anyhow, it was funny and it was delightful and it was lighthearted and it is like so well done. I mean, that literally made our night. For sure. Good. Watching that little short story. Yeah. Pixar, uh, man, they have such a magical way of storytelling and they have this, this ability to be able to transport the viewer into the shoes, uh, or in this case, uh, very thin footsteps uh, or legs of this baby bird. And so little things like it going to the waves and like you said, the, the how threatening the waves are, or even how it doesn't have its confidence yet, how right. it doesn't know how to, to go out and get its own food. And then by the end of it, you, you see how the confidence is there. Like, like um, the birds actually having fun finding food for all the adults and whatnot. So it, it was, yeah, it, it's a great example and it's not exclusive to that particular short. Like, I mean, every single Pixar short that they have come up with and I've watched them just, I am completely blown away. And what's most impressive too is how those shorts are really only maybe like what, five minutes long. Right. And by the end of it, they have succeeded in cultivating this very strong emotional bond with the viewer. We're like, I mean, you could be like on the verge of crying or you could be, laughing hysterically or maybe even having some sort of uh, moment of reflection in terms of different types of life experiences that you can identify with as it applies to that. So that, yeah, that I'm, I'm glad you finally saw that Steve. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. We also watched, um, there's a new show. It's uh, kind of a kid show actually. Yeah. Um, kid show. Your, your, your daughter might like it. Oh. It's Doug days. Kind of like Dog Days, but with Doug and uh, the old guy from the movie Up. Okay. And so the the episodes are like 10, 15 minutes long. Like they're really short. And it's and it's all about Doug, really. But it's it, it, it's cute, but it's, it's not necessarily funny. Uh-huh. Or at least not for me. Uh, maybe it's more endearing or charming. It's charming. Yes, yeah. for sure. It's not stupid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not dumb. Uh, I just think it, it is charming, but I think it's more for little kids. Oh. But I'm telling you, people at Pixar, at least whoever animates Doug, knows like the little facial expressions and, and like, oh, yeah. dog emotions. Yeah. Because that's what I found most entertaining about the show. Just like watching... Doug, Doug's eyes move and his mannerisms and, and everything. I mean, that I, they have it down. Oh, sure. <laughs> and that was the most entertaining part for me in that show. Very nice. But, so, so you were on a bit of a Pixar binge, it sounds like. Yes. Which is a very good thing, by the way. And you had to binge something. Pixar is at the top of the list. We rewatched. Actually, she didn't, didn't see uh, Toy Story 4. Okay. So we watched that again. Mm. I still feel the same about it as I did before. Right? Uh-huh. It was funny because she said, I want to watch something funny. Uh-huh. And so I go, okay. And she goes, Toy Story 4. I go, I don't remember that one being that funny. Well, I'll watch it again. And it wasn't that funny. I mean, there's like a, a handful of like, you know, like a spur thing, a dusting of sorts of <laughs> funny moments. But the movie itself is actually not that funny. No, I don't think by design they, they intended for it to be slapstick funny. I think that if I had to pick one Toy Story film that was the funniest, it would probably be Toy Story 2 uh, because there were, there were a lot of really funny moments in that whole situation. Toy Story 1 also was pretty funny uh, in a, a variety of different scenes, but I think Toy Story 2 takes the cake. If I had to pick one out of the four, I'd say two is the one that, like, if you want laughs, like you watch Toy Story 2. Right. Uh, but four was more of an introspective take on the characters because I, th- I think what was interesting about it, and, and we even reviewed um, this film and, and talked at great length about this, but I think what was interesting about it was how we were all under the impression about how after Toy Story 3, there were not going to be any more Toy Stories. They, they really bookended it with um, how they decided to go about ending it 
And then all of a sudden, Toy Story 4 comes out. And you're like, oh, wow, okay, so now what are we going to do? And so they they were, I think, playing around with some of the the different options uh, as it applies to the story. And and overall, I mean, it still, I think, was, was a good movie, but I do think you're right. I don't think it was... It wasn't the kind of film you watch for laughs. Right. Yeah. I think the funniest part of that movie was uh, Keanu Reeves' character with the... <laughs> What was that Crash Carl or something like that? Yeah, the motorcycle yes, guy. I'm Canada. <laughs> you know, and he's like doing like all the, like little flips and stuff like on the on the bike. And yeah. I mean, that was probably the funniest part. But well, in Forky, I didn't think Forky was that funny. What? It was not that funny. Okay, well, okay, so he wasn't like slapstick funny, like uh, Crash Carl or whatever, uh, Crush It Carl or Crash. I can't remember. But he had his moments where some of the, like, the way that, that Forky would just all of a sudden, like, jolt and look at someone in his eyes, his googly eyes would kind of like, roll back and forth real quickly in their little uh, casings and stuff. Like, I think a lot of the laughs from that wasn't so much the personality of Forky as it was, again, like, to the... The animators credit like the animators, you know, they like spent hours upon hours with plastic like sporks, basically, and yeah, just little, like little twisty ties. And, yeah, like basically like create a real physical version of this character and then notice like how stiff like it would move and everything. And I think that's where a lot of those laughs came from. But mm. uh, anything else, Steve? I started playing Destiny, Russ. I noticed I was uh, surprised to see you get into that game because you were playing Destiny 2 when it first came out along with me and Big, Big Baby, Baby Moose. Moose. Yeah. AKA a- a- Sausage Fingers. Yes. Um, But that was the beta. That wasn't actually the game. And I told myself I wasn't going to buy the game until I got like an upgraded Xbox. Mm-hmm. Which hasn't happened yet, Russ. And no. actually why I started playing the game was because I had spent 15 bucks for Game Pass and I was playing other games I didn't need to play on Game Pass and and I got Game Pass, hashtag, because because I wanted to play Fight Simulator Uh and then I couldn't play it. (laughs) There are so many games that you have not properly played because you don't have an Xbox Series X. So I'm like, okay, well, now what do I play that I haven't played yet? So yeah. I, I I installed Destiny. I actually, I had Destiny already installed, and so I started playing it, and I then just stopped playing it. Yeah, I remember it didn't hold your interest. I mean, it, and for me as well, like, I, I ended up playing Destiny 2 here and there because I had a friend who was really into it. He Both he and his brother uh, were very much big fans of it. Even to this day, they still, that is their go-to game. They, yeah. they just really enjoy it. So for me, it's like, okay, well, I'd like to be able to have some little chit chat and hang out and do whatever, you know, I, I'll, uh, I'll come in and join you guys. And of course they are leveled up to the extreme. You know, I, I'm like this little shrimpy dude coming in going, hey guys, can I, can I fight with you? <laughs> yeah. Basically tag along and watch you destroy everything and well, get experience from you. <laughs> and that's the kind of funny thing too, is that like, they'll always so they'll be like, Oh yeah, let's level you up real quick. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Level me up. Mm-hmm. You know, we go somewhere and like, sweet. Thanks. You know, I, I'm dying left and right because the enemies are so like <laughs> <laughs> much more powerful and stronger than I am. But then by the end of the, of the firefight, it's like, Oh, you've leveled up like 20 times. I'm like, Oh, thank you. Yeah, kick up debris. And then you're dead. And you're like, what just happened there? It was just dust that hit my yeah. eyes. <laughs> And then I had to wait 25 seconds to respawn. It looked like a black hole happened <laughs> and uh, we're still alive somehow. So are you in the similar boat where you have like a friend who's playing it? They've invited you to play along. And so you figure, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and play it. Or is there so, something else where like it, it's, it's actually capturing more of your desire? Like like when you open up your library of games, you look at it, you're like, you know, actually I, I'm gravitating toward it now. It was kind of D all of the above. Okay. Because, I mean, it was there, and I haven't, I haven't played it and since I played the beta. And yeah, I had a buddy who was playing it too, but he's so far along. He's like, yeah, you probably can't even join us until you actually get somewhere in the story. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll just, you know, play it and see what's what. So what do you think now that you are going through a bit of more of the, the game? Well, it doesn't explain very well what you're actually supposed to do. 
Um, and so then like there's all these icons that pop up on the map and then I'll go, okay, I want to go there. Mm -hmm. I want to do this. And then so I'll get like to some area with like a busted up church and it goes, oh yeah, you got to find all this stuff and they're littered around and like, okay, I'll go, I'll go find it. Yeah. (laughs) By golly, I'll go get it. Yeah. And so then like, you'll see these little posts with lights on them. Like, okay, I'll go over there and says, yeah, hit X button. And then you got to go recover some, some artifacts or journal. Like, okay, I'll do that. I'm going to complete the mission. Yeah. And so I'll do that and then I'll do another one and then I'll do another one and then I'll do another one and I'll come back and I'll, I'll like the same light that I checked for the mission like 20 minutes ago is blinging again. Like, okay, you got to go get the more journals Yeah, and it never ends. And so I was talking with a friend. He's like, okay, which icon are you going to? I'm like the green one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes like, I think you got to go to the yellow ones. I'm like, well, they, they should make it clear. Like, go towards the yellow ones if you want to continue the story. That's one of the biggest beefs I have with the game is everything is so unnecessarily complicated. It's like it, it's it's being complex for the sake of being complex. Right. Like, uh, and, and I'm, I'm a bit rusty on it because I haven't played the game in, in quite a while. But I recall how... They have like their terminology for different things, which are are traditionally speaking in terms of gaming, just gaming in general. They have different names for and all the while I'm just like, dude, just call it like what it's been called for the last 20 (laughs) years of gaming. Like why? Why? I don't know. Is is, just, is is there a desire to be fancy? Yeah, you know, like like I don't know. Like to me, they lost me when when it came to that. And then also too, you have to um, think about how with their game loop, um, they are they designed it to have kind of a rinse and repeat situation where like you know people could go out and they could sure do these raids. They they can conduct the, these these squad based encounters and stuff. But the 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 main I mean it, it's in a way it's similar to Anthem, right? Where like you go to these same locations, you have these same types of drops that happen, and it's all for the loot. Like you want to be able to get really cool rare items and also be able to level yourself up. And some people really dig that. And I mean I got to hand it to the community for Destiny. I mean for the most part there are um, a lot of folks who I mean they they really enjoy the world that right. that Bungie has put together. I think another thing is like I'll turn on the Xbox and I'll load the game and then all of a sudden like there's this cutscene that comes up. I'm like, "Whoa, well, what's that?" Or and and then I might skip through it or something like distracts me like, oh yeah. <laughs> and then I'll come back and like, oh, let me reload that level or let me just reload the game because I didn't click on anything and watch that whatever I just missed and then it won't show. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Okay. So I, I, and then like, it has this thing in Sea of Thieves, similarly to Sea of Thieves, where like you walk up to the person they go like, hey. And then like it cuts away and then it shows like some brief description you how to read it. Like, why can't you just talk to me? Uh-huh. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to talk to you for some reason. This is important. Uh, why is that? And they just give like some brief introduction. Like, what? I'm okay. What? Why are you here? Why am I supposed to talk to you? And then I don't know. I just I kind of waned my interest. I, I I want to level up my character. Mm. I want to be strong. I want to see what the game has to offer. But it just doesn't seem like it, seem, it just seems like they're making it way too complex. Like too. They need to make it simpler. They need to kiss it. Keep it simple. Keep Russ. it simple. Well, kiss typically. Well, technically speaking, kisses keep it simple. Stupid. If, if we, yeah, yeah, Russ. Yeah. G rating. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just think you don't want to be labeled as stupid. So I'm sticking with that. Actually, the last S can be keep it simple. Sucker. Steve. Sucker. Oh. Sanchez. I like I Sancho. I will give it to you, Steve. I like that. Keep it simple, Steve. Well played. Thank you. Well done, Steve. Mm. Anything else? No. no. I think I've uh, used up enough uh podcast time to You've uh, used up all your tokens. Yes. You're at the continue screen. I am. <laughs> and with empty pockets. Hey, yeah, with happily empty pockets. <laughs> Nobody touched the console. I gotta run to the token machine. Yeah, I- <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a quarter, but I have this like <laughs> dust moat. I'm going to put it right there. That's my spot. 19. 18. I'm trying to put a dollar in there. <laughs> 17. 16. Hold on a second. Like, <laughs> you're like using like the corner of the token machine to like flatten out your dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> some like person walks by. Hey, hey, I'm just trying to get tokens. Would you yeah. just take a like, dollar? <laughs> Everybody knew. Everybody understood that situation. And then it was always like, like you had like three seconds left of the continued screen. And finally, what's goes. Then you got like the jackpot of like, you know, valueless tokens that you just take. And you're like, oh, and then you sprint back. And yeah, they have you to do like a Michael Jackson, like, you know, moonwalker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> And you, you, you would probably do the exact same move that he did. Like when you successfully got it before it continue to reach zero, you're like, ah, yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you're back on there. <laughs> uh, and then that's what the parents came to come pick you up. Like, it's time to go. I'm like, no, I just, I tackled the, got the all that coin machine. Are you like, kidding me? Foreheads, sweat accumulating on there. Yeah. yeah those are the nah, days. Oh boy. That started my anxiety right there. I have uh, been looking forward to talking to you a bit about What If, because I, too, have ah. been watching it. I have not seen this week's episode yet, ah. so I'm one episode behind. However, I have been really enjoying the, the series. I do think that there are certain components of the stories that I find disturbing. And I think it's, it's interesting to kind of marinate on that for a minute because I enjoy all the different episodes, but I think because I have invested myself so much into the, the story as is like in terms of like how the, the movies from the MCU have unfolded. It's like, Oh, this is the timeline. This is how things work out. And I understand of course that what if whole premise is to like, kind of turn that on its right. ear and be like, oh, well, let's have fun kind of mixing up the formula and exploring like, oh, well, what if this happened instead? Sure, yeah. And that and that plays to the, the, the show strength. But I do think it's worth noting that I do feel, <coughs> excuse me. Oh. <coughs> a little bit of spit, a little, little chokage. That's hot. Do you feel that way at all when you watch a show? Like when afterwards, like certain episodes, you... You feel kind of like maybe creeped out. Mm, well, the last one. Uh, well, I so I watched. I'm up. On, I'm on episode three. So on the third one, yes. Oh, you haven't word. seen all of them yet. No. Oh, okay. I haven't. Gotcha. And I'm a little fuzzy on the. Is the third episode the zombies? No, Russ. Oh, what is it, Steve? It's when. Um, the there there there's a guy who's taking out all the Avengers basically. Guy taking out. I don't want to spoil who the guy is, Russ. Well, that's I, I understand, but I'm just trying to remember. I thought that was in the zombie one, but no. apparently this is something else. Wait, okay, well, so which characters are in it? Like like you don't have to say all uh, of them, but just wh who who are the ones that you see first? The Avengers. No. Uh <laughs> So you see Iron Man, you see Black Widow, you see the Hulk. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. I know that which you speak of. Long white beard, a pointy hat. <laughs> Haven't seen him in six months. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, yes, actually, that is probably one of my favorite episodes from the series so far. I really enjoyed that one in particular, and I loved how it ended. I, I thought that that was that was one where I was like, "Ooh, this is this is really some entertaining storytelling." I like the second one. I like the first one was really good. The second one was also very very good. This yeah. one was it was interesting. I wouldn't say it was on par with the with the first and second one, but it was. I mean, that that's, that's doesn't like lower it too far on the totem pole. That just means it. And they all can't be like, you know, 10 out of 10, but no, no, not at all. And I think, um, so you still have, I think three more to see probably, um, three. And I have gone through. So like I said, I haven't seen this week's, but like last week's for instance was, I don't know. Like it, it was pretty disturbing the way that everything kind of worked its way out which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it, because it was intentional. It was designed to be that way. But I would say the, I would, mm, hmm. the last two honestly are uh, a bit disturbing. Like I did, I can't remember. Have you seen the one with uh, Dr. Strange? 
N- no. Okay. Interesting. So the second one is if Star Lord was right. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some mighty white chompers you got there, boy. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Mighty pretty white. Yeah, I scrub them every night. But anyway, really loving the show, and there, yeah, there, there's actually quite a bit that you have not seen yet. I'm curious to get your opinion on, yeah, and see if you feel the same way. Sure thing, Russ. You may have noticed that uh, the shirt I have decided to wear for this particular episode it has a bunch of Overwatch logos everywhere, and it's because I have really rekindled my enjoyment of Overwatch over the the past couple of weeks. And I've been looking forward to being able to talk to you more about it. I know I mentioned it Mm. earlier in the week, but um, I've been having a lot of fun with exploring various characters. And honestly, I haven't really given the time of day up because Mm. I tend to just kind of go to the the characters that I've gotten decent at. Right. And I can actually, you know, Share the load. <laughs> Share the load. <laughs> Share the load. But yeah, like, um, to, so to give you an idea, I have, um, I've been having a lot of fun with Wrecking Ball. I feel like I'm getting better and better with Hammond. And I've been having fun with Widowmaker. Um, I've also been having fun uh, with Echo, McCree, even a little bit of Soldier 76. Soldier 76. And Zenyatta. So... Yeah. Um, I've been getting some plays of the games, not with Soldier 76, but I've, I've gotten play of the games with Wrecking Ball, um, McCree, and Zenyatta. I have not gotten, I don't think I've ever gotten a play of the game f- with Widowmaker or with uh, Soldier 76 yet. So, but it's nice because it's, I'm, I'm embracing their skill set and being able to figure out, okay, how do I leverage this appropriately so that it helps the team move along? Even with uh, Reinhardt. Reinhardt's <clears throat> another one that I've been putting more time into. So for those that don't know, I, I tend to main as either Farah or Diva. Those are like my two that I, I tend to go for. Even Mercy, I've been having uh, oh, more time with yeah. Mercy as well. And, oh, you know that I'm thinking about too, Steve? Yeah, that's right. Brigitte. I've gotten play of the games with Brigitte. I wonder if it's, but I think I'm, I don't, I still don't think we're saying it right. I don't think that's her name. Are you sure? It might be Brigitte. Uh, no, I, th- I think it's, it's pronounced Brigitte. <clears throat> and, and if not, then I think it's very close. Okay. We get an E for effort. Right. Mm. But anyway, that's a large smorgasbord of heroes that I, I mean, for, Most of my Overwatch career, I have not really played with at all. I must say, uh, Soldier 76's ultimate is useful, but it's probably the most generic and kind of bland out of them all. You know what I have found when I have tried out his ultimate is it's actually harder to pull off. And I, I wonder if when the game first was released that it was easier to do, which I have a feeling like a lot of the heroes ults were, were way easier to do because they were probably a little more OP and people were still trying to figure out how the game works. And plus the met, the meta of the game has changed so many times. Like it's interesting now when I play the game, because a lot of the characters that get picked for the most part are like doom fist is like super popular right now. Right. So is Sigma, um, may kind of ebbs and flows in terms of, of popularity, but Junkrat is like a, a super popular one. Diva, you know, is is pretty popular, but I mean, she's been nerfed so much. I mean, it, it, it's a huge departure from what she used to be capable of. But it, um, it, it's, it's interesting how like they'll have these periodic launches of an updated meta that then causes gamers to then flock to different types of heroes. Yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do, Steve? What are you going to do? Have you been experimenting with any other heroes? Or have you been sticking with like Torbjorn and Mercy? Um, well, there is one. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ross. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, I maybe a tad bit. Maybe a little bit. A little About bit. Uh, a little, little Roadhog. Well, I was, I was thinking of Moira because Moira has well, been. Well, I've been using her for a 
Not Why? that long. Yeah, Maybe a couple months. Couple months, right? You know, the game came out in 2016, and that was not a character. You actually scoffed at that character I for did. quite some time, and now she's kind of one of your go to characters. Yeah. She has, Ross. Yeah. But lately, it's been Roadhog, you know? I just wanted to be a tank. Roadhog actually is another one that I have started <laughs> messing with. <laughs> 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 I am in a rush. Mm-hmm. Want some candy? I'm a <laughs> one-man apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, that one. The other one, too, is violence is usually the answer. There's quite a few of them. There's a lot of them. Right? I do like the way that chain swishes and swashes like as he like runs it's very satisfying mm-hmm. but even that character you know the more time i spend with that character i realize how there is a certain finesse that you have to have with the, um ha- having the longevity of the character survive like right. you can't just like go in like actually you have to kind of keep to the walls i find just because you're such an easy target for everybody to just you know <laughs> turn you into a bullet sponge. What do you say you, Steve? Hmm? No, that's definitely true, Russ. There's been plenty of times when I'm fighting against him and I'm like, this guy ain't going down. And then I play him and it's, uh, I'm probably not staying with the group all that much. Right. Um, and then I just die in five seconds and then I'm back to respawn. Indeed. What are you going to do? Indeed, Steve. But I've been having a lot of fun. It, it has acted as a big shot in the arm in terms of my interest <laughs> with Overwatch. And I was even having fun prior to, to being open to trying these other heroes out. But now that I'm, I mean, that's like, what, close to 10 heroes that I've yeah, been is, really. messing around with and I've uh, been mm. having a little blasty blast with, you know? It's 10 of them. Okay. There was a trailer also that dropped a week ago, mm. Matrix Resurrection. Have you seen that trailer yet? Yes, I have, Russ. I think you told me about it uh, a couple podcasts ago, actually. Uh, <laughs> did I? <laughs> I'm not sure if I did, Steve. Uh, you did, right? I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, you did. And I saw it. You saw it? Mm-hmm. Mm. What'd I say? Uh, I, don't, I remember what, exactly what you said. I remember you told me about it. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you about it right now. In the event that you were smoking Uh, some crack. But what I think is interesting about the the trailer itself is Mm -hmm. that they they seem to be putting more of an emphasis on the first film, Mm. Uh, which makes sense because the first film is probably the most beloved out of all three. Ah, yeah. And uh, but I I do have some concerns about it. First of all, I miss uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Mm. You know, we have another actor who I'm guessing is supposed to be Morpheus, like kind of a younger Morpheus or something. But then you have Neo, who's back. Uh, Kenneth Reeves is always great. Trinity. Trinity's back. Okay. Carrie Ann Moss. So that's good, too. Uh, a bit of a bummer that that the other brother of the Wachowskis has not returned, to my knowledge. I think it's just one of the brothers. And so it's like, ooh. What's that about? So I guess I'm cautiously optimistic with mm. that one. Is that is that how you are, Steve? I am cautiously optimistic, Russ. As I am about a lot of these. Uh, this one's not a reboot. It is still a, a sequel. But um, a lot of the beloved classics in our pop culture day. Yes. Um, it's a bit of a slippery slope. I mean, I hold my I hold my breath quite often when <laughs> the, these classics are uh, tampered with. Well, and I don't even think that this is necessarily a reboot well, of not, the original, no, but no. although there seems to be heavy referencing of the first Matrix movie, um, which I guess if you're going to do that, that would be the one to do. But I I am wondering, what, how are they going to play this out? Because my memory, if it serves me correctly... Neo died at the end of Matrix Revolutions. So did Trinity. Like they, they both got killed. Mm. So to see this happen, I don't know if the, they're going to be clones mm. of their former selves or like how they're going to be able to tell that. It's going to be a rabbit hole that we're going to have to check out and find out what the heck is going on. Follow the white rabbit. Why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? Which, by the way, I mean, the blue pill is apparently what he's taking on the daily. If the trailer is to be believed, 
whole little vial of blue pills. Remember well, that? he is getting a little older, Russ. Indeed. Maybe he needs some blue pills for a good old Trinity, you know? Are you picking up what I'm throwing down there, Russ? <sighs> no. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. No. <sighs> no idea. Okay. I'm sticking to it. Great. Oh, um, so this kind of piggybacks <clears throat> off of your comment that you made about uh-huh. how you're, you know, you get, a, it's like a slippery slope nah. when it comes to certain uh, beloved older mm. movies and that sort of thing. And it's, it's no different when it comes to um, games. <laughs> and so I have a correction I need to make. Mm. So in the previous episode of Joygasm, we were looking over the Sony showcase of September, 2021. And one of the of the titles that we were very much excited about and looking forward to was the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Mm-hmm. I had said at the time that it was a remaster. I was mistaken because I had a buddy who contacted me after um, he saw the episode and said, no, actually, you need to look at the trailer again because... Um, the the at the bottom it doesn't say um, remastered it says remake mm. and there's a a big divide between those two words remastered of course means it's like, it's like uh, to a certain extent say Final Fantasy VII remake no, right sure. uh, but at the same time it's not a they didn't say Final Fantasy VII remastered it was Final Fantasy VII remake mm-hmm. this one is but well let me back up a little bit. What's interesting about Final Fantasy VII is that, for the most part, arguably so, it's more of a, a update to the combat system. It's an update to the art, you know, the, the graphics fidelity and stuff. And they did change up some of the the plot points, as, as you were informing me about, with regards to like how certain things either never happened in the original, or maybe they fast forwarded certain things. And so there there is a bit of a difference in that. So what's interesting about this is um, apparently they have hired a writer to rewrite the story of Star Uh. Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Oh, boy. So this has me really concerned because uh, for me personally, in my opinion, I'm one of those fans who played the original Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic game. And the story is one of the just the the pinnacle achievements of that game. Like, I think I even mentioned it in the previous episode of Joygasm about how the story was so well done. It was so well crafted in this title that George Lucas could have easily, in fact, (laughs) in certain regards, he probably should have used this type of story as a prequel, you know, as a movie prequel. And um, so as far as I'm concerned, like I, I really don't like the idea of them going in and changing things up. And so I did some digging on Twitter and I was coming across some of these threads and apparently it's causing a bit of a firestorm um, with the fans on here because they've, they've hired this person, Sam Mags. I don't know who she is. I've, I've never heard of her until now. Um, apparently she's a writer. She's done, um, stories for different types of, uh, other types of games and comics and that sort of thing. But what's interesting is, is how she has apparently, and again, I, I'm looking at kind of as an outsider looking in, seeing like what the discussion or the dialogue is, but there seems to be this, this, uh, this notion that she's really not, um, like a Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic fan. And so it, it is kind of surprising that someone like her has been picked uh, to, to actually do the rewriting of the story itself. Um, there are also other comments that she's made where like she, I think that uh, ba- again, based off of her tweets that um, she seems to really like, you know, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. She likes Rey as a character, um, these sorts of things. Um, and it, it's interesting because it almost seems like she kind of enjoys trolling uh, the fans of games like Star Wars KOTOR. Um, she seems to, to kind of have fun, um, I don't know, kind of mixing it up, so to speak, that sort of thing. 
But in terms of the fans, I was I was going down here and um, and they are not happy. I mean, they, they, they're definitely wondering, you know, what's the deal? Why? Why is there an, a desire or a need to change the story itself? Right. And as a result, it's beginning to, to kill the interest that the original fan base has toward this game. So and, and oh, why do they do that? Like, we're going to look for somebody who hates the game. We're going to try and sell. And then we're going to piss off the fan base. Yeah. And then, like, and, and we're going to have a big marketing strategy about this. You know, a big think tank. Because th- we, we really think this is the, the direction we want to we want to head here. You know what I mean? What? It's, it's bizarre. It, it really is. Because, I mean, I have the same question that's in my head. Is like, you know, where is this obsession or desire to, to rewrite the story come from? Because it just doesn't make sense. Like that was one of the crowning achievements. Like it's not just my opinion. It's the opinion of tons of folks. I mean, that that was such an achievement in writing. And it, it's weird to me how like there is this weird need to want to be able to, to come in. And basically it's that whole rewriting of history thing. Yeah. You know, this game came out, I want to say back in like either 2000 or 2001. It was in the early 2000s. And it's weird how just, you know, less than 20 years later or so that we're having this type of thing where like, you know, one of, one of the excuses is, is that, oh, we are updating the story to reflect like current times. I'm like, guys, like that's, that's quite a thing to say if, <laughs> if, <laughs> you know, like maybe if it was from the 1950s, yeah, I could, I could get there, but like this is less than 20 years later and I just, I find it odd. So anyway, this thread just continues on going on and on and on. And, uh, you know, not to, to dwell on it too much, but I mean, people, like I said, like they are, um, just really not pleased at all with, uh, this decision. And really what I think is interesting too, is it harkens into certain types of, um, I don't know, like, like other areas that my mind wanders to, you know, like, um, like for instance, so we know that Bioware actually is not developing this remake. It's this other developer aspire. It's a S P Y R. And then I, I also realized too, that, um, Lucas, you know, back in the day it was Lucas arts, but now I think it's called, I think I've written down here. Yeah. Uh, Disney rebranded them to be called, uh, Lucasfilm games. But apparently they don't have any kind of like large involvement with the game. Sony is the one who's producing it instead of LucasArts. So there's been this, this complete, and again, this is, this is based off of, of the research I did. This is my understanding could be wrong. I have no idea, but like, this is, this is the stuff I was able to find. It sounds as if both the develop, the original developer and the original producer have been detached uh, from this IP, which I'm like, okay, that's a really bad idea when it comes to something like this. Like, and I, there, there are, there are a lot of feelings with this, but, um, one of the things that strikes me is how, you know, when George Lucas ended up selling, uh, Lucasfilm and all of its properties and yada, 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 You know, one of the things that was really nice about when he owned it was that he was the the caretaker of his own IP. Like there it was actually really cool that he he wasn't just spamming his fan base with all kinds of different types of movies and TV shows and that sort of thing, um, because it made that original trilogy just that much more loved and like sought after that sort of thing. So it's, and, and the furthermore, like, again, my, one of the questions I have is, is like, why would you hire someone who's not a fan of the source material that they're hired for? <laughs> like, I, it, and it's an honest question. It's not meant to like, you know, throw shade at, at whoever the writer is or whatever else, not by a long shot, but, but it's, it's an honest question about, I think, one of the, the the issues that both Hollywood has and even the gaming community is that there is this narcissistic mindset 
of when you get hired on for a pre-existing IP that is iconic. It has had a huge impact on pop culture. It's known internationally. Like there seems to be not with everybody who's attached, but just there seems to be like like this growing issue of how people don't have the reverence or the, the, the humble integrity when they approach this, this type of source material, like they once had, like they're back, back in the day. Like if you got on one of these projects, like that was a, I mean, huge life altering deal. And it was, um, very much well known. People were vocal about how like they, they wanted to like do the source material justice. They wanted to, to represent it and, and be able to maintain it as best they could. And the last thing what they wanted to do was to like make something that would upset the fans, you know, and that to me, like that is the right type of approach to take. And we just seem to be kind of drifting away from that. And now people want to kind of inject their own propaganda or their own type of angle on it. And like, like Ryan Johnson, who's the director of star Wars, last Jedi, he did the exact same kind of thing. And all the fans are like, this is not a star Wars movie. Right. Even Mark Hamill was like, this is not what Luke Skywalker would uh, yeah. do. Like what, what is going on here? And so there's just a lot Shut of Shut up, Luke. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> cover him with a trench. He's just, he, he's off his rocker. And That's Luke Skywalker. Th- there, there's just been a lot of these these creative decisions, and especially when it comes to a, fran- a franchise like yeah. Star Wars, where you're just like, man, like all these different things are are really killing it. Which. Not and that, that's not a good thing. I, I, that's that's bad killing it, not good killing it. <laughs> and I think it's worth noting someone like John Favreau comes along, makes The Mandalorian, and everybody loves that show. Like you'd be insane not to like that show. And it's because he made a conscious return to the basics of what makes Star Wars Star Wars. And he didn't want to like intentionally go off the rails and go into this weird other space that quite honestly, that's not what star Wars is about. Well, it just seems like, I mean, just thinking about it right off the top of my head. Um, I couldn't name (laughs) any other movies that, that have this. I mean, I could limit it to star Wars, but it just seems like when I've looked into other series, like, you know, the star Wars or maybe the Witcher series or something, it's always, it always kind of comes back to, Oh, we hired this person. They're an activist and they're really outspoken to the fans about uh, what they like and don't like. I'm like, Oh gosh. And it seems like that's now on a, a, a reoccurring theme sure. where, where it's more about who's edgy and who, you know, if that person is so edgy with culture, maybe they'll write a great story that will you know, gather the, all the fans and, and, and rekindle the, the life and the passion about AIP. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it just causes more division. I mean, we don't need more division in 2021. We need less <laughs> division for crying out loud. No, it's true. Well, and I think it's, it's important to remember that uh, these different types of, of mediums of entertainment are designed to allow people to temporarily forget about the strife of the day. Right. You know, I think that, that even when, when it comes to sports programs, when it comes to movies, when it comes to video games or comics or whatever, like that's, that is an escape. And for that brief moment, you can have commonality with each other that perhaps maybe in your daily grind, maybe you don't have as much commonality f- you know, with each other, but for those few hours or whatever, it's like, there is that one thing that, that you can enjoy. And I think that, um, there there's, there's this, this danger of, I think causing a kind of a tainting to happen, but I'm going to stay positive though, Steve. I, however, having said all that, I think I'm going to have to pass on the Star Wars Knights of the Republic uh, remake game. And I'm not happy to say that. I'm disappointed to say that. I'm sad to say that because I would love nothing more than to, uh, you know, get into, into some Star Wars. So. Well, take your best shot. It's time for the topic of the day. Our topic of the day is 
is the Death Loop Impressions. This game has dropped just within the past week, and Steve and I have actually sat down with the game over the past three days, four days actually, and have given it a uh, a nice initial run through. We've put about I would say six or eight hours into it co- yeah. collectively. Is that sound about accurate? About accurate. Not a review, just an impression. Just, an, just impressions. Yeah, we're gonna do our best not to actually give uh, major spoilers or anything like that. But we are gonna talk a little bit here and there about the what, what we have experienced. Right. Experienced. So Ex- far. Experienced. So this is a title from Arcane Studios. Mm. This is a studio that I personally really like a lot, mm. and um, I was very much looking forward to this game in particular. Mm. What are your uh, initial thoughts of the game, Steve? Well, um, it it is a bit slow. It is a bit of a slow burner so far. I mean, I'm really trying to put together the pieces to make the story um, really make sense to me. I mean, I don't really know what I'm doing there. Um, in the beginning, we see what happens. You're like, okay, well, maybe they'll, you know, give us a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And then it just seems like, you know, we're kind of wandering around like, um, you know, we're like, we're lost in the, in the, in the ocean or something. And, uh, it's hard to kind of figure out what, why we're doing there, why we're caught up in what we're caught up in. But I think um, partially that has to do with, um, any kind of game where you're kind of in this loop, right? There's not that many of them, but yeah. I mean, um, you're you're in this loop. If you die, you start over over again, and you gotta have to you you pick up little clues along the way. But I think what happens there is if they don't give you enough clues um, that are exciting enough, it just feels like you're just starting the entire game over again and over again and seeing the same level design, the same enemies, and the same this and same that. So. Uh, it's hard for a loop game um, or loop type, I guess, to really feel fresh and interesting when you they you see so much of the same stuff repeatedly, right? right? So um, for me, it's it's a little bit slow. So I think for me, I, I understand where you're coming from when you when you make that comment because I think that there is a period of time where we're having to understand the world that we are in, right? And Excuse me. Oh, a little bit of ah, there's a little uh, loop Ooh. there. Death loop. In there. Oh, my goodness. Blah, blah, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think that Arcane is being very intentional with the doling out of the information. And I think it's one of those games where you get more out of it the more you put into it. And so I think, I mean, like, for instance, we're at the point now where we're starting to understand how the game loop or rinse and repeat works broadly with the game where we realize, oh, okay, we know that we have like a certain amount of uh, people that we have to take out, but we don't know where they all are. You know, it's a part of that search and discovery exploration part of the game, which keeps it fresh because it's almost like you're on this like treasure hunt to find these different people. And the kicker is, is that because the game itself, so the loop portion of the game has to do with that you're, you have to basically complete as much as you can within one day. And then at the end of that day, it then resets itself back to the prior beginning of that day. And so it's interesting because that it's, it's interesting because it's kind of a timer but you control the timer to a certain extent because you get to choose which district you want to go to at any given point of that day. And when you go to those districts, it's not as if there's like, you know, Oh, I only have like five minutes to like go and do what I need to do and then leave. Like you dictate how long you want to hang out in that district for. And then when you think you've done all that you need to do within that district, then you can exit out. And then the, you know, the day rolls forward by a certain amount of time and you go from like morning to afternoon. And on top of that, there are certain events that transpire at very specific times of that day that we don't know. um, First of all, what transpires or what time events transpire. And we also don't know when they transpire. So I think that's where the, the kind of the brilliance of the game begins to shine is that you have, um, this this 
constant freshness of trying to figure out, okay, if I go and I, I know that this person exists at this location at this time, okay, cool. I have that fragment of information. Now I'm going to have to try and figure out, okay, where does this person, is this person in this district or are they in that district? Are they, and, and where are they exactly? And at what time are they doing that? And so you're having to fit this puzzle together. And it's one of those types of deals where I can see how like the groundhog approach can affect the gamer in a lot of fun ways. You know, like when I think of the movie Groundhog Day, for instance, you've seen that movie, right? With Bill Murray. Yes, Ross. Okay, no. I just I had to make sure. Good movie. Classic. So when you think of that, you, you remember how Bill Murray's character was a little apprehensive mm -hmm. at the beginning. You know, he, he realizes he's in this loop and he's not sure what to do. He's kind of freaked out a little bit and he's, he's hesitant to really kind of push the boundaries and whatnot. But then as he tries to break the loop, he becomes more aggressive. He becomes um, willing to try out different things because this essentially is his own sandbox. And I feel like that's exactly what death loop is as well. Where like as a gamer, we don't know what we are supposed to expect, right? We're in this new world. We're plunged into it. We're like, what the heck is this? And so we end up doing a lot of sneaking around. We don't want to cause a big scene or whatever. And then like, as you play more and more and more and you realize this is on a loop, suddenly you become more desensitized to what's going on. And you realize you got to take care of certain things. And as a result, you're then encouraged to explore the game in a sandbox fashion. And I think a lot of the different weapons that you come across, as well as even some of the abilities that you come across, they aid in that kind of sandbox mentality where you can figure out, okay, how do I get past? Do I want to sneak past all the enemies? Do I want to just go in guns blazing? Do I want to do a little bit in between? Do I need to actually safeguard my, my uh, say, retreat back to the exit? And how do I do that? Do I need to set up booby traps? Do I not? Like, And so I think that that's really fun. In addition to all of that, then you also have this overarching story that, you know, it, it is linear in its own way, but that it progresses as you are able to make these certain types of discoveries. And not only that, but there are certain key items or elements that don't reset once you have found them. And I think that that was a very shrewd move on Arcane's behalf because I could see how the game could very easily become frustrating. Because, of course, like, you know, if, if you end up dying, then the, the day also resets and, and, you know, you have to start the loop all over. You lose all your weapons. You lose the different things that you've done. So how do you balance that, right? How do you make it so you don't burn the player out? You actually cause them to go, okay, let me give us another shot. Yeah. No, I and I definitely get that. Um, so I think that that is the task at, at, at hand that they have to accomplish. Um I just don't feel like they, they did it fast enough. Um, I will say, though, they like the environment, certain environments do look, you know, very good. So it, it, parts of the game where you have to go explore like the the ray tracing and the lighting and stuff. I mean, you know, that that looks good. And then you go outside and then it's just that overcast day. It's just the the haze. And then you look up and the sky is white and then the, the water's all iced over. It doesn't move. Um, and it very, and it feels very limiting because you know, like to me, I want to, I want to feel like the game is a place that I want to spend a lot of time because I'm enjoying being in that environment, just kind of unplug from life, plug into the game. And it doesn't seem like, I mean, I know they're trying to go for a mood yeah. a bit, um, but it doesn't seem like it's very, um, it's a very like, pleasant place to be beyond, beyond like certain scenarios where, where you are in the atmosphere. Sure. Um, or like, for example, like the enemies, um, which again, we're in the beginning of the game. I have no understanding why they're all wearing a mask, but all the enemies look like just faceless, uh, you know, very small amount of textures. Almost like um, mannequins. Kind of like mannequins. Yeah. Um, but to me, since I don't know where it's going yet, it mm. just looks like it's low detail enemies that have basic animations to them. Right. Um, so like if you go up and you assassinate somebody, it just looks like the, the, the polygons or the textures just envelop each other. Like it, you know, like it's almost unfinished in a way. Um, that being said though, one of, one of the, one of the 
elements that stands out to me is the voice acting. The voice acting is is done very very well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of use of the F word. I will say that. I mean, like every sentence, like, what the F are you doing? Well, this is what the F I'm doing. Why, why the F are you doing that? I'm like, okay, just say something else. But I mean, the way they, they carry across the lines is definitely entertaining. I, I will give the, 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 the voice actor and the voice actress uh, uh, props for that. Yeah, no, I, I think it is definitely worth talking about the relationship between Colt and Juliana because the the banter that they have is definitely one of the highlights. It was really funny because uh, I had a friend who was playing this game before I, we started playing it. And one of the first things he told me, because I wanted to know his thoughts uh, right just off the cuff. And he was saying, he's like, you know, the personality of Colt reminds me of you. I was like, <laughs> really? And he said, yeah, the way he talks and what he says and how he says it, that sort of thing. He said, you know, I could totally see this as you if you were in a video game. I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. And uh, I think that uh, it, it is a lot of fun to listen to the two of them, you know, give their their dialogue and, and the quips and give each other crap and tease each other. And it, it, it's a very complicated relationship. I like that. I like how it's not just, oh, I hate you and I hope you die. I'm going to get you. Like there, <laughs> there is clearly like a lot of history between these two. And I just I, I think it is a lot of fun. I laughed quite a bit at the the various types of of dialogue i think it's very smartly written um and i think that that is another instrument that keeps it fresh right because especially if you find something of note or value whatever it is that does also kind of push that that story along as it goes i also wanted to um talk about how my first encounter with juliana you know it raised my blood pressure because it's, it's, it's this thing where like, you know, that she's hunting you, you don't know where she's going to show up. So when she does, you're like, Whoa. And, and you're trying to do what you can. And I think that is never going to get old because the stakes constantly get raised the further you get into the game. And especially considering the fact that like, if you die, like for instance, I have this uh, trinket that, um, it, you know, if I die, then it, it essentially rewinds like tracer style from overwatch, but it, like it rewinds me back a ways to be able to redo that. And I think I get two attempts. And if, if I fail on like the third attempt, then the whole loop resets itself. And so that that's the penalty. What do you think of the AI? Like, do you think the AI is pretty simple or do you think it's good? I, I think the AI it's interesting because I think that the aggressiveness of the AI ramps up considerably once they know where you are. Like if they don't know where you are, I think that the AI is actually pretty easy. Right. I think though, um, in terms of like when they charge you, like they see you and they run after you and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think that that's when things get a little dicey because then they, their, their weapons are out. They're looking at you and, more often than not, there is more of them than there are of you. Right. And so that that's one of the, the threats, so to speak. It seemed like when we were playing, like there would be a group of them and you wanted to distract them. And so you would throw a bottle and then, you know, you would hear that, you know, bro, the glass breaking and then like they all just don't move. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well now what? You know, but then... Um, uh, or like if you, if there's a couple of them and you go assassinate one person, like just toss them over the bridge, they go Aah! all the way down. The other person just sitting there like, hey, isn't this a beautiful day? You know, and then you. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, no, th there are some puzzling moments where I'm like, they surely would have heard <laughs> right. that. So yeah, no, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, what to make of, of that per se. I also ran into a bug no. That freaked me out. Uh, just a you know a game bug, not mm. not a literal bug. Yeah, it was a centipede or something. Else, no, 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 no. But it it was uh, murder hornet. Uh, kind of like I was like, man, this is uh, <laughs> uh, this is not good because I was literally in the menu system. Ah. I, I paused the game, and then all of a sudden, like the menu system itself disappeared. Ah, yes. But I but if I moused over it. Um, it would still make the sound effects and it would still, right. you know, kind of respond as if it was there. But then if I clicked on it, nothing happened. So that uh, was a bit problematic. So I have a feeling there are certain bugs uh, that need to be ironed out. 
That is a PS5 bug, Rush. I actually looked into it after. Really? That. Yes. It, that, that issue doesn't exist on the PC. Who knows if it exists on the Xbox? I didn't even read it if it's on the Xbox. Well, the game's not out for on the Xbox yet, is it? Not it's yet. It's just exclusive I, on the PS5 right now. PS5, yeah. yeah. So that's on the... It, that's a bug that's got to be ironed out. Squashed. Squashed. On the PS5. Yes. But that's, yeah. Other people have experienced the same thing in the menu. Only in the menu. Only in the menu. Right. Well, that's good. Speaking of the UI, so that is one of the critiques I do have of this game so far, is they have elected to go with kind of like that uh, mouse cursor approach, right? So like, you know, if you have a PS5 controller or like, you know, when the game comes out on Xbox, we're conditioned to use the analog sticks or the D pad to be able to kind of navigate through any given menu. This one is similar to destiny, right? Where like yeah. you have this cursor and you're having to like move it and it's, you're moving it to this box and then you have to move it over here then move it down to this box. And to me, that's not an optimal console gaming ex experience that I want to have with the UI and UX. I think that if you were on a PC, absolutely like that is, to what's to be expected. That is the norm. That is the standard for that. And I don't necessarily understand why that there are certain games that have elected to do that. Um, because again, just in my opinion, I feel like that it's kind of a time waster if I have to sit there and like wait for this thing to drag over here, as opposed to like, if you have it, you know, programmed in a way where if I just tap up or right or whatever on the D pad and all of a sudden it's like, Tink, it's dire. I can press a or X. Sure. And, uh, you know, be on my merry way. Do you feel that way at all, or does it not bother yeah, you? Yeah, well, much? It, it doesn't bother me that much. Uh, I do know what you're saying. It does make the um, it makes the console feel different, and maybe it almost makes the console version feel simple. Mm. Um, because yeah, we we're we're accustomed to like highlighted boxes. Cards, yeah, basically. exactly. Not uh, not arrowing with the mouse. So well, even the PS5. Deal. If you think about the 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 UI for the PS5 they have that card system in yeah. the lower third area that you can access. I mean, it, like clearly that is the kind of like, like the, in my opinion, the optimized way. But. Yeah. You know, one thing I, I think about the PS five has a leg up with uh, the game over the PC and Xbox is that the PS five controller. Yes. Like, I don't know how they would do it with the PC because they got the little speaker that's in the PS5 controller, which brings that almost like 4D element. Yes. Uh, because when you know, when Juliana starts talking to you, I mean, maybe that's a small spoiler. Eh, it's not really a spoiler. No, I mean, you're she's, good. She's you're good. But uh, you're, you're good, sit bro. <laughs> Thank you, bro. You're sitting there on the couch, you're like, you know, just playing the game, you know, lights are low and dim, and then you know, you're trying to figure everything out, and then Juliana starts talking at you right through the controller. You're like, what is going on? And that's not going to happen on the Xbox because, um, I mean, you don't have a speaker on the controller nor on the PC. You're just going to have your like your desktop speakers or whatever you have. Yeah. So um, and the controller, I mean, that they have really brought a new element to gaming with that with that controller. They have. The, the PS5 controller is the star of that console, period. Like, yeah. I mean, there, there's no bones about it. The haptic feedback in that controller, it's, it's crazy because they have single-handedly dated the rumble control. Right. And like, you know, regardless of whether it's for the Xbox or for the PlayStation, that was such a, a like, you know, like dual shock controller, sure. for instance. I mean, I remember having fond memories of that when uh, I played Metal Gear Solid and right. the, those really like innovative <laughs> ways that they were kind of uh, taking advantage of the controller. Sure. And the haptic feedback, I'm like, my goodness, this is such a, a nice, just, evolutionary step from what we had and going into taking it further, because to your point, it just makes it that much more immersive. And I, you know, and again, like to what you said too, with the, having that speaker, like that speaker in the PS five controller and, and the PS four controller had it as well. That should never be underestimated. And it also should not be overlooked in terms of the game developers, because it adds so much to the immersive quality of any given game. Right. And I love it. I mean, I love how, like, when Juliana speaks to you, it's not through, like, your home theater system. It's through the controller. So it's almost like she's, like, kind of invading your personal space. You're like, <laughs> yeah. what the heck? So in the game, does she is she's talking to you, like, through a radio, or is she, like, in your I think, subconscious? No, like, it's, a, it's a radio. It's a radio. Yeah. Huh. And if, if you recall, like, throughout the, the, 
the world itself. Like there are those those big loudspeakers that she's on the PA. But like he'll try and contact her and she won't say anything. Right. And I think that's part of her messing with him. Like, I think that that's part, again, it reminds me almost of, um, the classic mad comic spy versus spy. Like that there's a certain element of it that brings me to that. I think also too, because the art direction of the game is very intentionally sixties, right? It has that that kind of spy espionage sixties, maybe early seventies look to everything. And, and, uh, even the, the the districts that you go to, they combine the '60s look with also like a very graphically heavy, almost um, I want to say um, avant garde look. Uh, it's it's kind of difficult for me to put into words like like how they're combining uh, these different types of, of visual aesthetics. But um, no, I, I think it, it is a lot of fun and. Um, what do you think of the combat? We haven't even talked about the combat yet. So it, we, we talked, we touched on it a little bit earlier with, uh, with like, if you're going to assassinate somebody, um, I, I think that, so the, like the sounds of the guns and stuff is pretty cool. I, I do like that. Um, like if you shoot the shotgun, you know, with the re that has the right amount of recoil. And I think the right amount of, you know, thump, uh, to get you excited that you're actually shooting something that's got some, some hit. Um, or if you're pulling out your, your machete, you know, it has that little, you know, steel scraping sound. Um, of course, we haven't seen all the guns yet, but uh, th- that part of the combat is definitely cool. Um, that being said, uh, there there is a bit of a disconnect where, like, if, you, if there's an enemy that's around you somewhere, it seems like the like the distance and if, are they on your left or on your right or above you? It's, or, a, it's or a little disorienting. It's disorienting in the fact that, they, that like if, if they start talking to you, you don't know where they are. They could be like 50 feet away from you and they sound like they're right next to you. Or they could be like fixing a car 10 feet away from you. It, that's what it seemed like when I was playing the game. I would hear somebody talk. I'm like, where in the world are you? Like, are you above me? You know, are you floating around? This guy? That's what it seemed like. I think the audio for me was okay. I didn't, I didn't get... I noticed you struggled with that. Yeah. I didn't struggle with the audio uh, of that as much. I became more disoriented. Like if I was in the middle of combat and especially like if the enemies were just right there, if they're in my personal space or whatever, I didn't know if they were on my left or my right or whatever that, that, that part gets a little wonky for me. And it does remind me a bit like the game overall reminds me of the, dis- of, <laughs> I totally butchered that the dishonored series, right? So Dishonored 2 is a game that I enjoy quite a bit, but when I got into combat with them, the same type of thing happened. I think it's kind of part of their game engine. Um, And you have to kind of roll with it, I guess. Like you have to come up with, with, uh, okay, I understand. Like I, I can't just like, get up in their grill and take them out. Like, like there needs to be a little bit of space between because I know that more often than not, the AI is going to behave in this way. That's going to like cause me to like lose track of like where they sure. are. And then they're going to be gunning me from behind and yeah. take me out. So yeah, you, you just got to um, plan accordingly, but also too, like we haven't even in the game in our, in our playthrough, like we were introduced to the notion that there are certain types of, pretty awesome abilities that either are science based or maybe even supernatural. We don't know yet, but that I think is really going to turn the tide in terms of like how all that combat works. And, right. and uh, so I'm very much looking forward to it. I think, I think that they have a Pandora's box of different types of tools and abilities that we have yet to experience. I think that's going to make the game even more fun. So I don't know. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with the game so far. I think, like I said earlier, we're just on the cusp of really getting into it. I think the more time we put into it, the more we're going to get out of it. It's gotten already high praise from IGN. They gave it a 10. GameSpot also gave it a 10. So clearly, like, they've played through the entire game. Stayed Um, up all night. End of the next day. We'll have to see what goes on. One last thing, too, that's worth noting is I love how 
self-aware cult is. Like some of his comments he makes, like he even made the comments like, why are all these people wearing masks? Why do they have colors on? Like, you know, he's calling things out that we as gamers have the same kind right. of question of. And I think that one of the strengths of the game so far is how quickly we have bonded with Colt. I know I right. have. I think Colt's great. Like he'd be like a buddy who like, I'd love to like go grab a brewski with or something. <laughs> he's just, man, he's, he's really funny. So anyway, that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show, not to mention it helps us monetarily do what we love to do. Also, make sure you wallop that subscribe button. Maybe hack that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single episode of Joygasm, which drops once a week every week. You can also do a search at Joygasm TV on your favorite social media platform of choice. And last but not least, do a search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. In fact, right now, you'll probably be seeing us play either Deathloop or Overwatch. We'll see you next week.